Um, my name is Joachim Kunis, as they just uh, announced. Um, I work at a company in Belgium called Combel, and I'm the co-organizer of a local user group. Um, this talk is uh, called How Doctrine Caching Can Skyrocket Your Application. And the first time I, used, uh, I gave this talk, um, it was at our local user group, and it was at the night that the Falcon Heavy was launched, so we watched the, uh, the launch while I was giving the presentation. So during this first night, I had to use the simulation, but as we all know, it was a success, so from now on, I can use the actual uh, uh, photo. So welcome to my talk. Um, and it is uh, about um, the internals of Doctrine and caching uh, in Doctrine, um, and how a combination of the two can skyrocket your application. That is, if you are using Doctrine uh, already. So first off, what is Doctrine? Um, and I would like to start with a question, who is using Doctrine already? All right, quite, <laughs> quite a few of you. So you probably know that it's an object's relational mapper, and according to Wikipedia, it is a programming technique for converting data between incompatible type systems using object-oriented programming languages. So basically, it takes the records from a database or another structure that is not compatible with our object-oriented way of working in PHP, and it um, maps the data um, into these objects. Uh, first of all, some terminology, but I will skip through them because most of you are using it. Um, you have an entity. Um, we need some kind of mapping um, to describe how the properties and the entity map to the records or to the fields in the database. We can use a repository which is used to fetch data from um, the entity manager or the database. And we have the entity manager itself, um, which is used to uh, access everything in the database. Um, there is a, um, a project on GitHub called Doctrine 2 ORM Tutorial. It's from the uh, Doctrine uh, organization, uh, but I forked it to show you some, um, show you some code um, that I can execute. So let's try to do this. Um, I can't see this on my screen, so this will be a bit hard, but let's try it. So, here I have my application, um, and it has a couple of files. We have three entities. Um, so the application is basically, we have a product, um, we, have, uh, we can assign bugs to, a product, uh, to, pro to different products, and we can assign users who reported that bug, and uh, engineers who are, um, who are required to fix the bug. We have two other files, we have a uh, bug repository, and we have a SQL logger, um, which I'll be used uh, in a second. So, um, in the tutorial, we need, uh, we need Composer. Um, that's already installed, so we just run Composer uh, install. We uh, drop our database, um, because it's a SQLite database, um, and I already ran this tutorial, so I have to uh, delete it first. Uh, then we can ask uh, the schema manager to execute uh, or to create our schema. So now Doctrine is calculating everything that's needed to um, represent our object into the SQLite database. You have this caution um, remark that don't use in production because it will just execute the SQL statements whatsoever. Um, next up, I have a, a very simple file, which is uh, creating a product. So we can use create new product, we can take the arguments um, and flush it to the database. So this isn't anything exciting, it's just creating new objects. So here I execute this one with, my, uh, with the name ORM. And the system gives me back that I have created product one. I do the same thing with products two. So now I have two, I have two products in my database. Um, and I can use the Entity Manager to get me all the uh, products and then list them. Um, nothing fancy. We just see what we just put in the database. Next up, um, instead of listing them, we can query uh, s uh, single uh, products. Again, nothing fancy, uh, displaying the name. Um, but 
here is where um, Doctrine really excels, and uh, it's, it's by updating uh, product properties. So we fetch a product from the database, and we want to update the name. So here we just say, set the name to our new name, and we flush it to the database, and Doctrine knows how it should be uh, stored in the database, uh, or what queries it should be uh, executing for this entity to be stored in the database. Um, this one doesn't have any output, but it will be clearer later. Um, same thing for users. I create a new user. Um, I have my own user with ID 1. Um, and then next up, I have to scroll a bit. OK. So this is um, creating a bug. So I, first of all, I, I fetch my own user. So I have user 1 later on I will uh, do uh, as a reporter. And also, uh, user 1 is the um, engineer that, is, that, that will get assigned to it. And then we have a list of products. And then we just um, create the new bug. Um, create a new bug, add some uh, data to it. Then we fetch all the products that were uh, supplied that this bug uh, applies to. And then we set the reporter engineer, and then we flush it again, and we get our new bug. Not surprisingly, bug ID 1. Um, here we can list the bugs again, uh, nothing fancy. Um, but you can see that um, you can see that we fetched the bug, and in the while loop we did get reporter and get um, uh, engineer, and this also fetches the correct data from the database. So um, those are all things that we don't have to uh, take care of. Then we can show another bug, all the same. Here we can uh, create a little dashboard query. So for a specific user, give me all this, um, give me all the data. Um, so we're writing some DQL, and then we do some joins for the different uh, users, um, and we fetch the data. And surprise, surprise, we get. Pushed enter too fast. Um, we get the correct um, correct output. Here is the same example, but using a repository. Um, and the cool thing about using a repository is that we can um, create methods which are a bit self-describing, and all the queries are in one spot. Um, same output. And this concludes the complete tutorial of Doctrine. Um, so. For many of you, because a lot of you are using this, uh, this is very uh, nothing new. Um, but this is the foundation of uh, the uh, of some internals that I will explain. Switch with it back to the slides. All right. So for some in, uh, internals. Great. What was the password of the? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I had a fancy uh, little uh, graph showing uh, our application on the one side, an entity manager in the middle, and then the database on the other side. Um, just close your eyes and use your imagination. Uh, the middle one was the entity manager, and inside there was uh, a couple of other building blocks that I will uh, gradually uh, explain now. So. On the one side, we have an application, which is uh, querying the entity manager. And the entity manager, is, uh, on its turn, is querying the database. Um, going back into the entity manager, and the entity manager gives our uh, objects. So the entity manager, as I just described, uh, is the central point uh, of the ORM, how you communicate to uh, Doctrine. Um, and the entity manager manages every entity you are using. Um, so this was the same slide with the graph. And in the middle, in the Entity Manager, you had a little block called the unit of work. And the unit of work maintains a list of objects affected by a business transaction and coordinates the writing out of changes and resolutions of concurrency problems. So internally, our Entity Manager is using a unit of work. And uh, that's some kind of pattern um, which is keeping track of all the work that needs to be done in the end when you are flushing to the database. Um, so this unit of work uses a transactional write behind, and this means that only at the end, only when you are flushing the database, 
you're actually starting a transaction and executing all the um, queries that needs to be executed to um, represent what was in memory into the database. Um, so it delays all the queries, and that means you don't have to um, open a transaction in the beginning of your request, and then uh, in the beginning of your web page request, and then closing it at the end, which takes up uh, way too long. You can just, uh, at in the end, call that, uh, call that flush method on the, uh, on the entity manager, and everything gets written to the data store. Again, the graph shows you um, the entity map, and an entity map is something inside the unit of work. Uh, and the, the identity map um, is a list which ensures that each object gets loaded only once by keeping every loaded, entity, uh, every loaded object in a map. And before trying to fetch a specific object in the database, it first looks in the, data, uh, in the uh, identity map if the object is already there. This is a, a, a very important concept because imagine if you uh, load a user and uh, two seconds later you load another user, uh, you, you load the same user, you want that object to be the same or you, ha you, should, uh, or you have to keep track of what object is representing what user um, by yourself. So if you um, ask the entity manager for user one, you always want the same object. So you can always manipulate the same object. Again, the graph, but I will skip it, <laughs> I will skip it now. Um, so entities are in a given state in the entity manager. Um, you have an entity in your application which hasn't been added to the entity manager, and this is in the new state. Um, so the entity manager doesn't, um, doesn't even know about this object because it's not, it's not registered. If you do entity, ma uh, entity manager persist, then it gets the managed flag, and then the unit of work knows it has to keep track of the specific object. You can also detach a, an, an entity, um, and this can be by accident, like when you serialize an entity and you will unserialize it again, the entity manager won't know that object exists, or you can do it um, explicitly by detaching it from the uh, entity manager, um, and that could be for performance reasons or whatever reason. Uh, uh, and the last is the removed state, and the removed state marks a entity to be in the next transaction to be uh, deleted from the database. Um, so now we saw the complete middle of the graph, the entity manager, and we are looking now to the right side, which here was a database. And if the data is queried in the database from the entity manager, then it has to get back into the uh, identity map. And the identity map needs to hydrate objects. So if you do a query, you get raw data, and it has to be hydrated into uh, an object representation. Um, and this is quite important uh, for performance, because this is where every time you load an object, you have to hydrate everything in your, uh, in your object. When hydrating, let's go to the slide again. When hydrating, um, for instance, a user, it knows it has a foreign key, or it knows it has a relationship with uh, a list of bugs that are assigned to those to that user. Um, and the tricky part is it's that it doesn't load the complete database into memory by just following every association and then creating a complete graph. Uh, and for that, it is using a concept called proxies. Um, and a proxy is an object that doesn't contain all the data you need, but it knows how to get it. So this means that if you load a user, the property of the, um, the, property of the bugs is replaced by a proxy object, which acts like a list of bugs. But the moment you do get bugs, it will execute underneath a query to hydrate the complete list of bugs. And this is... Um, this is a powerful concept because if you are loading a user and in the request itself you don't care about how many uh, of you don't care about the bugs, it won't. Ju it just won't get loaded from the database. So it's a very powerful uh, system, but you have to keep it in mind again if you want to um, make something uh, more performant. Um, 
Um, and again, I have the same tutorial, um, but I will use um, I will use the SQL logger file, so you can actually see what's happening. So if I now go to my internals and I execute the same tutorial again, but with uh, SQL logging, I again do composer updates. Um, you can see the previously created database has to be destroyed. So if I do a drop database, it knows how to, because all the mapping is there, it knows how to drop the database, which is now not important. But here I create a database. And here you can see that Doctrine knows we have a user table, a bugs table, we need some indexes. Um, we need a join table here. Yeah, a join table because we have many products linking to many products. So Doctrine does all this for you. That doesn't work. So again, all the same examples. Um, I won't read them all, but the cool thing now is that we can see uh, all the uh, underlying SQL statements that are executed in the database. So here we just create a new product. Uh, in the moment we call flush, we start a transaction, flush some things to the database, and we commit it. Um, here we create another one. It's the same query, new uh, arguments. The list of products, just not a big surprise, does a, a select statement and then it uh, prints everything. We can find a specific product, again, select statement, nothing fancy. Um, when we update the product, we have a select statement and then we um, change something in the object and the moment we call flush, Doctrine has to calculate what has changed. And in our case, the name has changed, so it has to create an update statement. Uh, create user, again, nothing fancy, an insert statement. Um, and here is where uh, things get more interesting. So I won't scroll up here, but I have a um, reporter user and a, and a uh, engineer user. And I assign both uh, my own user to it, so that's user one. Then we get the products and we persist it uh, in the database. So what you see here, is the identity map in action. So the first query is the select query for the user. And this is user one. Uh, and this, is, this object gets assigned to the bug as a reporter. But I fetch the same user again uh, with ID one um, uh, from, the, uh, from the entity manager and assign it as, a, as, the, engi as the engineer. But Doctrine skips the whole uh, um, query part because it knows it has that object in memory. So it just fetches that one. And then again, a new product and the transaction knows how everything needs to be saved. So we have two queries, um, the join table and the bugs table. Next one, we have the DQL. And here the DQL is doctrine query language and that, that gets translated into um, into SQL, um, and then we fetch some data. Uh, and because here we do uh, an internal join, this data gets loaded uh, automatically, but the products, we don't uh, include that in the join. So that, will, that's, that is on this, uh, on this moment, it's a, it's a proxy object. So here you can see we have one big uh, join query for the reporter and the, and the assignee. And the moment we fetch all the products, it, it fires up a query to the database by, uh, to load all those, um, all those products. Um, same here, simple query. Um, and because we didn't, uh, we didn't join the engineer, it has to use the proxy object to fetch the user. Um, the DQL here, again, um, is one big query. So the DQL gets translated into SQL. Um, and you should remember that for, uh, for the caching in, uh, in a while. Uh, again, same query, nothing fancy. And that's how the tutorial is explained using SQL statements. I also have some examples of the, of the internals. Uh, and the internals here uh, is just what the um, unit of work is storing in, the, uh, in memory. So I get the repository and I find all the products and I find all the users. And then I get the identity map 
and I print for every class name. It keeps uh, a record of all the objects that are loaded. And then I do some, uh, I print the hash, and the hash is the, um, um, the primary key. And then the JSON encode is just a stupid way of serializing uh, an, an entity, uh, which will look kind of strange. So here you can see we have two products loaded and one user, and this is uh, the serialized version of the, um, of the entity that is in memory. So if I fetch user one and I fetch it again, it will just get loaded from memory, so no hydration, no database query. Uh, next up is how it um, tracks the changes. Um, so we get one product. Um, so this is, this is an example of that I have the same object. So I, fa I find product one, and I use SPL object hash to know what the uh, key of what hash of the object is. And then I create a new um, variable, but I do use the same query. So if I run this, you'll see that I have product one and product two, but they are pointing to the same object. Uh, and this is the identity map in action. Um, OK, so the previous one was finding by identifier. And um, that can be uh, looked up in the identity map. But here I um, do a query on the name. And the problem here is that the identity map doesn't know um, any properties. It, it does know, but it's, um, it's uh, purely based on identities. So if I, I'm, I'm still using, I'm still getting back the same product, but I get another um, I still get the, get the same uh, object, but it has to do some magic to finding the uh, correct entity. Um, and here is how it computes the uh, changes. So I fetch some uh, objects, uh, I fetch some properties from the unit of work, um, change some um, properties and the product, and then I uh, say, now you have to compute the changes, and then it knows um, what uh, things that have been changed. So at the top, nothing changed um, until the moment I uh, ask to the unit of work uh, calculate the changes, which automatically happens when you do entity manager flush. Uh, and then it sees, okay, so we have this object hash um, and the name was PHP and it has been changed. So it knows it has to create an update statement. All right. OK, so we know um, Doctrine has to do some uh, tracking to know what things have been, uh, have been changed. So very quickly, if we create an object, it's a new object. We persist it by uh, calling the persist method. Then it gets managed. We do a flush, and the unit of work knows it has to calculate the answer statement. There's a transaction, and everything is in the database. If we get an object, we request the object on the entity manager. The first thing it does is it looks the identity map. If it can't just find it there, there's a database query. And hydrates the object, saves the object to the identity, manage, uh, to the identity map, so it gets uh, managed. If, if we now update that product, we get it from the uh, entity manager again. We get the object, it's managed, we change it. If we call persist on the uh, entity manager, nothing happens because the object has already uh, persisted, uh, is already managed by the system. And if we flush it, the unit of work knows it has to create an update statement. Um, all right, so delete was just the same. That was a bit too far. All right, we're back. Um, so deleting the file, 
Uh, nothing fancy, it just has to create a delete statement. So, um, a, a, a tracking policy is the way we instruct the doctrine to, uh, or the unit of work, uh, how to um, manage the changed uh, properties. And by default, we use deferred implicit. Um, and this is just a property by property comparison. So we have the complete object and uh, the system just looks at the initial state and it looks at the new state and it just compares the two. And if it sees any differences, um, it stores it to the database. Um, this one calls persistent by reachability because if we persist one object, it will just continue to the object graph um, and find every property that's, that's changed and objects that are reachable uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, this one is the slowest just because it uh, traverses the complete object graph to find changes. We have deferred explicit and this is just the same except it only um, does this on objects that we uh, persist in the entity manager. So there's no dirty checking of new objects somewhere. Um, you have to uh, add it to the persist method for um, explicit track uh, for explicit tracking of the of the change port properties. We can uh, change the track policy by just adding a new mapping. Um, in this case, annotations. You can use XML. And the last one is uh, the last tracking uh, property is notify. Um, and notify does it the other way around. So from within the entity, you have to uh, notify some listeners that something has changed. And for that, we have the notify property changed uh, interface. And it's just, um, lists, it just has a, has a bunch of listeners that the uh, doctrine entity manager can inject. Um, and then you have to publish every change you do to the, entity, uh, to the um, listeners. So you can see every time you change, a, you change a property of an object, you have to notify. Uh, so this is very performance because Doctrine doesn't have to inspect everything on every property, but it's a bit annoying that you have to manually uh, say something has changed. So another improvement you can do is um, um, alternative query results. And alternative query results can be used for read-only data um, or, uh, and scalar values. Uh, and you can have a nested object graph, but completely in scalar values. So here is an example of that. We have uh, the same query as we, that we had before, but now we say get every result. And now we get a nested um, array. Um, so there's no lazy loading. Um, there's no objects uh, anywhere, but we can still use the same nested uh, array for uh, displaying things. So this is good for when you are uh, using a dashboard and you want to, uh, you don't want to uh, hydrate a lot. You just say, "Get me the plain, uh, the plain data," and move that to the uh, to the view. Um, so this is very uh, performant for that because you skip the whole hydration part. There's also a concept of read-only entities. And this doesn't um, remove the hydration, uh, so you can still use the, um, uh, the objects, uh, but it removes the tracking policy uh, completely. So if you mark an object as read-only, the moment you hit Entity Manager Flush, it won't even, it won't even look at the properties of, uh, of that object because it knows it's a read-only object. Um, and that can be easily done by just saying read-only equals true in the entity mapping. So we have another uh, demo for that. Okay, so if we run it again with the SQL logger. Um, what we do here... Um, so this is, a not, this is without read-only, so this is the normal bug that we saw before. So we're fetching bug number one, and we're creating a new bug. Here we're persisting a new bug, changing something on the original bug, and then we're flushing everything to the, uh, to the entity manager. Um, and then again, the new bug, which has now been flushed to the database, gets persisted, um, gets changed, and then we flush it to the database. Uh, so there's no read-only mark here. So what we see is we have a select statement, we create a new one, and if we start the transaction by uh, calling flush, 
You see that the new one is inserted in the database and the old one is updated. And if we update then the new one, that one gets updated too. So this is without using any of the things I just uh, mentioned. Now, if we change another entity, so the product now gets uh, the read-only flag. And this code is exactly the same. So we have an existing product, we create a new one, and then we, again, save it uh, to the database. If we look at the queries here, you see that we select the old one. We change something, but the old one isn't persisted to the database because the uh, entity manager isn't looking at it. But the new one is. But from the moment it is persisted, the new one is read-only too. So if we change the new one and refresh the entity manager, nothing happens either. So this is um, a quick win for all logging tables or something like that. But don't do logging tables and objects. Okay. All right. So that was a quick example. On to the next improvement. Um, so we had lazy, uh, lazy loading uh, collections. Um, we can also have extra lazy loading. So by default, all collections are lazy, uh, which means the moment you hit the proxy object, it gets loaded. You have then the eager strat strategy, um, and that's always using a join. So the moment you hit the database, you fetch everything in one, and the entity, uh, the relation is uh, eagerly loaded. And then you have the extra lazy, and the extra lazy is the same as lazy, but um, it uses specific database queries. If you, for instance, load the products and you do a count of the uh, bugs, if you do lazy loading, it will just fetch all the bugs and then do a PHP count. If you use extra loading, it will try to do a, a count select statement on the database. Um, so this is, uh, in some scenarios, quite handy. And it is just uh, added here and the many-to-many uh, -many, uh, annotation that you want to fetch it extra lazy. So these are all the improvements we can do um, inside of uh, Doctrine. Uh, and now we can go on uh, a, step a step further and start using caching. Uh, so we have OK, so we have Doctrine Cache. And Doctrine Cache is just a uh, sub-project uh, of uh, Doctrine. And it describes an interface which, say, it should have a fetch, um, a contains a save and a delete. Um, and in the back end, it has some cache drivers using uh, APCU, memcached, file, uh, Redis, whatever. Um, and this will be used for caching things in Doctrine. So, we have three uh, main caches in Doctrine. We have the metadata caching, um, which is um, uh, it removes the overheads of constantly uh, parsing all the annotations. So we have a property, and we say that this maps to this type, uh, to this uh, field in the database. And on every request, because PHP doesn't uh, live long, uh, we have to recalculate that. So the base caching you should have in production is a metadata caching. The same uh, applies to DQL, because DQL is a variant of SQL. Um, and every time this is executed, it has to be translated to uh, SQL. So the only thing that's changing are the variables or the parameters in the, in, in the query. So it's, uh, it's stupid to always uh, regenerate the SQL. So use that um, even in a file cache. And then we have the result caching. And the result caching stores the SQL data um, into cache. Um, it still needs to hydrate the uh, objects. Um, and the join will be stored as is. Um, so who knows how the, a join uh, result that looks like. If you do a lot of joins, it is huge because it has to repeat uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, records from the uh, initial table. So, this complete set is stored in memory, and then it's hydrated. So if you think about it, you should cache as close as possible to the end of the application. So you could do some custom caching. So with custom caching, um, we try to cache the hydrated result. So we have the um, entities loaded into memory, and they are completely hydrated, and we try to cache that somewhere. It is 
even quite simple to do that. You could just use a decorator over your repository, and every time the decorator gets hit, it calls the uh, objects. It stores it into cache first, um, and then it returns it to the, to the application. Which um, seems nice, but is not such a good idea, because we are now serializing entities. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you serialize an entity, it is by default detached from the, uh, from the entity manager. And you are serializing collections. And as I mentioned before, too, it, those can be proxy objects. So um, it's a rabbit hole without an end or whatever. Um, it's, not a, it's, it's a very bad idea uh, to use, uh, to use this, um, this, this kind of um, hydrated caching. Um, they even, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, rewrote the caching mechanism, so it's uh, always, uh, yeah, so the result set is using um, raw data uh, and memory. Um, and memory for all the reasons I uh, mentioned before. But this is now a non-issue, uh, well, not a non-issue, but with PHP 7, there was a logo here, so with PHP 7, um, the hydration um, is, qu is very quickly. Uh, we have uh, we have improved a lot, um, so we don't we don't really care about hydration anymore. Which brings us to the um, to the new kit on the block, um, second level caching. Uh, who knows second level caching? Well, in the context of doctrine, um, it's kind of yeah the same of in the concept of uh, CPUs. So. Um, we have a CPU which has level one caching, which is very tiny, but very, uh, um, very quick, but also very expensive. So they have to keep, they have to try to find a balance there. Then we have the level two caching, which is close by to the uh, CPU, which is um, a bit slower, but more affordable. And then we have memory, which is the slowest of the, uh, of the three. Um, but you, yeah, you can store a lot in there. So in our um, uh, comparison with Doctrine, the level one caching is the identity map. The level two caching is the somehow um, raw data of the identity map stored in a, memory, uh, in a cache somewhere. And the memory and, uh, maps to the database in our case. So second level caching can be used. Um, uh, it won't cache the entity uh, uh, instance for the serializing problems I mentioned before. Uh, it only stores the entity identifier and the values. So as you would see in the identity map, but then dot as an object. Um, and it is best suited for read-only data because you are caching data very close to the uh, application. And if something changes um, in the database or something, um, you have to be uh, aware that a stale version of the data is still somewhere in memory. Uh, we have different uh, caching types. We have the uh, entity data, which stores the ID of the entity and all the values. We have collection data. Okay, we have collection data, which stores the uh, owner ID, and then the list of entity IDs it is referring to. Um, and we have the query data. So for a given query, we have a list of IDs for a entity. Um, the last two just keep a list of IDs um, and the uh, entity itself gets loaded by using that ID to fetch the entity data. So if you are in the product and you are caching the bugs you, uh, and you're marking the bugs uh, collection to be cached, the bug entity itself has to be cached or it won't work. So it's... Uh, just a matter of adding an annotation in the uh, entity, um, and for the uh, for the collection, it's also an annotation. You have to do some configuration, but I'll show you that in a second. Um, you can add a region to a uh, to a cache uh, config, and the region is just some kind of group that you want to use later on to invalidate uh, your caches. So you could, for instance. Um, use all products. Uh, you could use a region where, let's say, products underscore the type of uh, an, an attack. Uh, 
So if you are changing the tag somewhere, you can then invalidate all the um, all the caches with that tag. Um, but yeah, uh, and the most important one is that they can have variant uh, lifetimes. So you can have a very long cache, and then you can use a region to uh, have a very short cache. Uh, we have different modes. Um, the read-only one is the default mode, which is just uh, fetching from the um, from the cache. Then we have the non-strict read-write, um, and this one is both um, reading from the cache and storing uh, data into the into the into the database. Um, and this is good if you want to update your entities. Uh, from time to time. And then we have the read write, and this is implementing locking. So if you are want to write if you want to write something back to the database, you your uh, database backend has to be uh, your um, cache region has to be uh, has to support locking. So other parts of the system aren't updating things to, to the to the database while the uh, while they are using the old cache. Um, those are the entity caches and the collection cache. You can also use the query cache, which is just the same. So here we have a list of uh, countries that we want to uh, cache. And we just say on the uh, create query that we want to cache that specific uh, result. Um, very quickly, here we have the uh, get mode. We have a put mode. The normal one is default, where it, if it doesn't find it in the, in the cache, it will get it from the, uh, from the database. And then we have the refresh mode, where you can uh, write a cron job, which refreshes all the, um, which al always reads from the database and refreshes just the cache in the database, uh, in the cache. Right. Um, one thing to um, uh, keep in mind is that query caching uh, bypasses the second level caching if you're using delete or update queries. Because if it's updating uh, data in the cache, it has to somehow find a way to store it in the database. So if you, uh, if you do an update query, um, the update query will run in the database, but the cache will still, be with the old, uh, will still have the old value. Here we could use the cache evict hint so that they clear the cache. Or you could be more fine grained by using the uh, caching API that you want to evict a region uh, if a query is executed, or more specifically, yeah, more specifically, that we um, fetching uh, updating user, um, ID one, and that we want to evict uh, the specific entity with um, ID one. Um, second level caching has some limitations. Um, it has to be a single application. Uh, for the reasons I mentioned before. So if you have a front-facing, um, a public-facing website, and there you're using second-level caching, and you have a back office which is pushing data into the database, this whole concept won't work because you have no way of telling the, the, um, the front end that data has been changed. So it has to, uh, everything has to go to the entity manager. And you have to use a single primary key column. But that's uh, not that bad. So um, I have another uh, demo. Yeah, second level caching. Um, so here I will be using the uh, file system uh, cache driver, um, and I want to make sure that that directory is empty, so the cache is, uh, is cleared. Um, I have a bootstrap file where I configure my entity manager, um, which I've been using the whole time, by the way. So here is where I inject my SQL, and this is the uh, configuration of the SQL driver. And here I just enable uh, my second level caching, and I inject my configuration here, which I say file system cache, and it's located in the data directory. So if we look at an example here, we, um, uh, we say we want to use the cache and the product. That's uh, read only, and we add a optional uh, region. So here I uh, fetch all the products uh, from the database. So this, because the cache is empty, uh, will, create it, will create a query, 
So we have this query and we have three products. And if we uh, look at the um, look at the caching directory, we have uh, three uh, data data cache files for the entities, and this one is the query. So here is the query for the um, for the find all what we just executed. So here you can see this is the first uh, caching. It's a uh, product class, and it has the ID uh, one. Uh, yeah, two, and the name uh, dball, and this goes on for the other products. So this is just storing the raw data, uh, and this is the final one, and this is the um, the query cache, which just references the three IDs of the specific product, which on his turn loads those uh, caches. So here I execute my uh, list product again, um, and no query is executed because everything is fetched from the uh, from the cache. So this is not the uh, identity map, because this is a completely fresh uh, PHP execution. Um, here's the same on the bug, uh, bug entity, where we uh, add caching for the or we add caching for the association. So here we have this one, the bug isn't cached, but here uh, the uh, collection has not uh, been cached yet. So the query executes, and we know that we have one product. So the next time we execute it, we, as this one isn't cached, execute the query again, but the collection is cached in the second level caching. Uh, here's the same example um, with a, um, where I build a query uh, with a parameter, and I say I want to be cacheable, uh, and this just does exactly the same. So we have this query, and when I execute it again, the second level caching uh, picks it up and just returns the uh, data. OK. No. All right. So um, in conclusion, um, keep your identity map and all the internals in mind when you are using Doctrine. Um, a lot of people say ORMs are slow, but it's just because they're using this, their, uh, the ORM for the wrong thing, or they're losing it, using it completely wrong. Um, at a minimum, use the basic caching, so the query caching and the mapping caching, uh, and use opcode caching, um, because you don't have to change anything in the application, and you get an instance uh, performance boost uh, just by avoiding the, uh, the annotations to, the, to be processed on every request. Um, cache heavy queries with a result cache, so check if the uh, query is so big that it's more convenient to um, store it locally and hydrate it than fetching it every time over the, over the network. Um, and give second level caching a try, um, even if it's only for some, um, for, some object, uh, for some entities. Just have a look at it, it could solve uh, some of your problems. Um, and as a, a last remar uh, remark, the query cache from Doctrine is not the same as the second level query cache, because the query cache uh, from Doctrine stores the complete join as is, and the second level caching stores uh, identifiers and values, and then uh, figures out how to create objects from, the, from those. Um, and with that said, um, thank you very much. Um, again, um, I'm working in Belgium for a com hosting company. Um, I have a user group, uh, and uh, the repository I just used uh, can be found here. Um, and I'll put the slides on joined in, so while you're there, leave some, com uh, leave some feedback. Uh, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.